Sorry? Maybe my uh, time czar? Time czar. Time czar. I'm just asking if you can. Do you want to be? Yeah? All right. Welcome to EE133, lecture one. Woo! After that, that was challenging. <laughs> I just came. Uh, I just came at 6 a.m. to the airport this morning. So, yeah. So appreciate that. <laughs> but if I forget some words, that's because my brain is not exactly at its best. Okay. So uh, welcome E123. It's uh, digital signal processing. Um, name is Mickey Lustig. I'm a faculty ECS department. Been here for about seven years. Six, oh, six, seven years. And uh, you'll hear a lot about what I do, which is um, research in MRI. And actually, the song that you heard uh, before is called IRM, which is uh, MRI in French. Um, and it, it encompasses within it sounds from the uh, MRI scanner. Okay, so uh, Charlotte Ginsburg. Um, so just to uh, kind of uh, you know, get a picture of what's going on. How many uh, EEC students here? So the majority, any non-EEC students? Okay, which department? Math which one? Math. Math? Okay. Math CS. Math CS. Math. ME, okay. Math. Okay. All right. Okay, so... Uh, um, I'm not sure what you guys are doing here. This is a really uh, demanding class in terms of effort. So unless you're really hardworking, then um, probably not a good place for you. Okay. So just a warning. So no complaints later in class. Okay. Um, before we actually delve into um, you know DSP, I'd like to just go a little bit of, of administration and kind of you know create some uh, expectation, as well as uh, going of kind of what, what the things we're going to kind of cover over class. And then, uh, then we're going to start. So the class website, um, there's going to be a few forms of communication, because I couldn't figure like one, way, one really good form of communication between us. But there's going to be the class website, which is an open website. Uh, which we're going to post a lot of the information. The notes are going to be there. I haven't posted the notes for today, but I'm going to try to post notes before the class, uh, at least night before the class, so you can uh, uh, follow, follow up. Um, but the class website has a lot of information, um, so we're going to post notes. We're going to post homework over here. Um, we're going to use Piazza uh, for forum type of communication, and then homework submission will be through vCourses, okay? So three ways. Uh, till we have like one unifying solution, I think this, this is the best thing I could figure out with. Anybody knows what, what is this, the class logo? You know what this, what this thing is? It's a what? Huh, spectrogram. Well, it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a spectrogram. It's, it's what? Frequency modulation. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of frequency modulation. So, yeah. A chirp, yeah. So it's, uh, right. So if you sweep a frequency um, in a linear way, so sweep frequency uh, linearly uh, from low to high, um, you're going to get a signal that kind of looks like this. It's a sinusoid that you know, sweeps, and it's called a chirp because this is kind of what birds would kind of do. Um, but the frequency, if you look actually at the frequency domain, and this is what's called kind of a spectrogram or a waterfall diagram, you see the frequency is also increasing. So this is a time frequency. Really represent what we're going to do in this class. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about time frequency. Okay, so um, this I will talk a little bit about afterwards. Um, so I'm Mickey 
my office is 506. We still haven't figured out uh, my office hours, but I'm going to post them by the end of the week. Uh, we're going to have uh, two amazing TAs, uh, Frank Ong and John Tamir, who uh, are not here today, but they'll be uh, on Friday. And they're going to have also uh, office hours. Um, Frank is mostly going to be in charge of the lab. And you see that there's going to be a significant portion of this class is actually the lab. It's going to give you a lot of hands-on experience uh, in DSP. Um, and John is going to be um, more towards uh, you know, homework and um, the sections. Uh, we're going to meet Mondays, Wednesday, Friday, uh, 10 to 11. And there's going to be a GSI section uh, on Monday um, immediately after class. So it's pretty convenient in the sense that you don't have to move. Okay, so I hope you appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what also we're going to have are what's called lab bashes, where we are going to have um, lab assistants and uh, GSI to help you um, work on your labs. Uh, some of them requires technical, right? The technical uh, things, and I'm going to talk a little about about that. Uh, some of them requires kind of like work with good installation of some piece of software. So we've had some trouble before, and so we're going to try to help you as much as possible to get over these hurdles. But I have to say this is part of the experience in the sense that any real system that you're going to deal with is going to have these kind of clunks. And so it's good to start doing that um, early. Um, the text that we're going to use is uh, Oppenheim and, uh, and Schaefer. Um, we're going to use the third edition, but if you have a copy of the second edition, that's okay. Um, we're going to use homework from the third edition, but if uh, we're going to post uh, question, the, the question on B courses, if we're going to, uh, you're going to see the question basically a scanned version of the question on B courses, so you can still use the um, the second version. But you know, it's it's been quite a while, so I think those are qu quite in the market. Yeah. The way? Access code. Oh, I'm not sure what it even means. I think the access code is for the website for the material. So I think there's extra material on the website. But uh, there's no need for an access code. Yeah. Um, there's uh, links for other material that you can find online. So these are actually some free books. Uh, on DSP and wavelets. So wavelets are, we're going to talk about wavelets in the class, which is um, something that's not in OpenIM and Schaefer. So for that, you can, uh, we, we're going to have notes, but yeah, you're going to have some reference. You can actually go to these references and use them. Um, one book here that you see is the Technician Ham Radio um, Manual. And so how many here have an amateur radio license? Good job. Yeah. OK. So it used to be 0. So before? Or it used to be 1. But um, one of the things that we're going to use uh, for labs and for you know practice is going to be radios, so software-defined radios and actual radios that you're going to be transmitting digital information and decoding and all sorts of, doing so all sorts of experimentation. And so um, we're, for, in order to transmit, you need to have a license. And so we've decided um, two uh, years ago to in introduce, basically to have everybody go through an uh, amateur radio licensing exam. Now, I have to say, this is not um, something that's extremely difficult in the sense that probably 50% of you, if they take the exam right now, they will pass. Okay. Um, just with random variation. But um, with just a little bit of going over the material, you can actually do it. So it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about EE198, um, which is really um, a lecture series I'm going to give on Wednesday no uh, evenings, which will prepare you towards uh, this exam. And you can take that as extra unit um, this is what we've done this year, so we realized, well, it's a little bit more work. Maybe you should 
get credit for this if you, uh, if you need it. So you can register for EE198. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, to get credit for this amateur radio licensing. But I would, but everybody will be required to go through that, whether they do that through the class or by themselves. Um, and we're going to start using those radios uh, towards the end of uh, March. Okay. So I'll talk more a little about that. Um, so there's information about um, of, about um, S software defined radios and and, and ham. Uh, there's some resources that you can find here. Um, a little bit about the tentative course um, outline. Some of it maybe will be shifted uh, based maybe on interest and progress, but this is approximately what we're going to do. Okay, so homework um, and what the grading distribution would be. So homework are going to be there's going to be weekly homework that is going to be mostly analytical. So we're going to separate the programming uh, Python experimentation part from the homework. Um, and the, those will be weekly. Uh, we're going to post them on Friday night, and then they're going to be due the next Friday. Once we post solution, uh, we would like you to self-grade them and Submit the self-grading by Monday. Now, yeah, you're kind of probably thinking, well, what? Why do we need to self-grade? Well, we have a grader. But the truth is that I realized that the only way to make you look at the solution is actually if you become your own grader. So this is what we're going to uh, do. And the grader is going to go over your solution, uh, your, your grading, and verify that is that is. Correct. So there is some supervision in that sense. Um, but uh, that has been a very successful last year. So mind you, that small effort will prepare you very well for the, for the exam. Um, lab, uh, we're going to have about six labs. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what they're going to be, actually quite a bit of that. Uh, but those kind of like the. You know, it's the, you know, it's the dessert, you know, it's like the, it's the sugar, it's the, um, it's the sweet in this class, I think. Uh, students really like them, and I think they're a lot of fun, okay? So, but they do require a significant amount of time, because anything that has to do with implementation and programming, you can get into bugs and debugging. That's part of the fun. The most fun is, of course, getting it to work. But the road also is, is quite interesting. But again, I warn you that uh, these should not be taken lightly. And when we post one, we sh you should probably start on them early. Um, this year, you're going to have two midterms. Uh, we used to have three. We realized this kind of killing you in terms of work. So we'll just kill you less. So we're going to have two midterms, one uh, in the middle and one, one a little bit towards the end. And that will leave you enough time to work on your project. Okay, so this class is also has a project at the end. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about the project when we, get, uh, when we get there. But the idea there is that you're going to have some default project where it's going to be kind of like a challenge. But then if you want to do and a default, it's not like default. It's like a cool project that is going to be a challenge across uh, a few groups. And then uh, if you want to do something else, you're more, more than welcome to. And the, the default one is going to be based on radio, okay, like transmitting images or um, doing weak signal communication or something really, really exciting and cool. Um, any questions up to here? Yeah? Uh, no final. Yeah. Well, there's a final project. Does that count as a, something final? Right. But there's no final exam. So when you end with a project, you end. Okay, okay so uh, homework will be all uh, online submission. So either you uh, typeset it or you scan it and submit it on B courses. Um, you know, typesetting takes some time. So you can have, you know, it's okay if you have a combination of scanning and typesetting, whatever you choose. But at least it has to be readable. Okay? 
And um, it's going to be on B courses. Then you're going to be self-grading it. And then we're going to take a look take a look at what you've done. Projects we're going to talk when, when it actually uh, gets to. Um, the labs. So this is kind of like an overview of what the lab's going to be. Uh, lab zero, which is just, so how many people have used IPython before? Ah, that's amazing. OK, so three years ago when we started, it was, again, zero. Now it's kind of like more spread out. But we're still going to have a, um, a lab zero, which would be Python, like numerical Python tutorial to go through how to uh, work with uh, NumPy and SciPy uh, and those packages. Um, and use your sound card, because we're going to uh, heavily use it, and so on and so forth. The first lab um, is going to be basically creating a sonar out of your laptop. Okay? So that's, that's a lot of fun. Okay? You'll be able to basically transmit pulses, be able to uh, detect the uh, received reflections in a room, and, um, and that's, that's, that's a good one. Uh, second lab is going to be about um, capturing signals f that are transmitted by airplanes, so beacons from airplanes. It's called um, see, I'm, I'm losing words, um, but it's ADSB. Thank you. Thank you very much. ADSB. So airplanes uh, have these devices on them that always transmit packets. It's called like secondary radar. So primary radar is, is like the usual one where you have a ground station, transmit pulses, and receives signals from the airplane passively. Uh, and this is a secondary radar where airplanes actually <coughs> transmit actively packets with their information, position, um, altitude, direction, and so on and so forth. Those are transmitted non-encrypted and can be picked up using the software radios that we're going to give you, and then you're going to be detecting and decoding those packets. And uh, we created a nice wrapper for you that would also uh, interpret what's inside the packets and display that in real time on a Google map. So any airplanes that are flying around, you'll be able to see them. Okay. So that's, that's a nice one. Um, the next one is going to be about FM demodulation and looking at spectrogram time frequency. And so we're going to be listening to a radio station and decoding them using those, radio, those software radios. But you can also be able to hear hidden stations that you cannot hear with your normal radio. Uh, and these are called um, sub-carriers. Okay. Um, lab 4 will be... Uh, tuning on to a GSM cell phone base station and using the signal, its signal to synchronize the clock uh, or the calibrate the frequency on your software-defined radio. So that that's the first thing that a phone does when you turn it on, okay, and it connects to a base station. And so you're going to implement some, uh, something like that. Lab 5 will be communi uh, radio communication. So you'll start using those radios. We have an interface that connects your computers to the radios. And we're going to play with, with that. Um, lab six, we're going to do digital communication over those radios. You're going to be sending packets that are going to be um, with an amateur radio protocol that actually can be picked up by stations that people put in their backyard or on their houses. And you, the, once packets are received, they're aggregated to the internet. So you can do cool things like sending a text message out of this radio without using a cell phone. So you're going to create those um, packets on a computer and send them through one of these radios. Uh, send yourself an email, position, and so on and so forth. Communicate between each other, text to text, and so on. So this is a really, really nice, uh, nice lab. There's going to be one lab on com uh, compressive sampling, and we're going to talk about even what, what actually that means. OK, any questions up to here? Okay, so information is over here. By the way, there's a menu here that talks a little bit about Python, how to install stuff. We're going to use Anaconda, um, the RTLSDL, which is a software-defined radio that we're going to be using, and information about HAM and information about the lab are going to be uh, on those lists. All right. 
So the other thing that I want to say, okay, so we're going to, you're going to get an amateur, everybody here is going to get an amateur radio license. Um, every Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30 from the next six weeks, six or seven weeks, I'm going to give a two-hour lecture about amateur radio and prepare for the, um, for the exam. Now, everybody can just take a book and just read it, but one of, wh one of the things that I'm trying to do with those lectures is also to kind of show you, okay, so you get a license, what, what you do after that with a license. And so there's going to be some demos and um, a little bit more demonstration. Who took my sophomore seminar class? Yeah, was it good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. You have to say that, right? Right, you have to say that, because I'm here. Um, but we created this class here where all the information now on ham radio is going to be um, is going to be there, and so that's where I'm going to post it. And you're more than welcome to register for that class, but you don't have to register for that class for credit. But you can if you want to. So this is just an opportunity for you to get another, uh, like a general um, uh, unit. Okay, so it's going to be one unit. Okay, any questions? Meetings are going to be uh, Wednesday, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, we're going to have an amateur radio exam on March 16th. Okay, that's when you have to be ready. Um, and we're not, the, all these lectures are going to start next week, not this week. Okay, so the first one's going to be next week. Where did, where's my mouse? Okay, I don't know what to do now. All right. Do that. No, that was a mistake. Um, there you go. Okay. So, right, self-grading. Uh, we're going to have, yeah. Uh, okay, so you're required to, so there's, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later, but there's three classes of amateur radio. We're going to, you're going to study for the first one, which is technician class. But there's also general and extra. And if you get an extra, a general or an extra, you get a radio for free. Then you don't get it for free, but the what? Yeah, you can study for the extra, but I'm not going to cover that material. But you can go and study for it. Well, of course there is a point. Oh, no, if you have already an amateur radio exam, don't. Yeah, that's, there's, there's no point in signing. If you already have a, a license, then don't. Uh, unless, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's going to be lab checkoffs, so we haven't done that before. We're going to see how it works, um, and this this year we have some help, really nice uh, lab assistants to do this, and so the we're now we are we'll be able to give a little bit more credit for that work in in terms of the uh, percentage of the final grade, um, because before it, it was not as as much. <laughs> okay. All right, so a little bit about me before we go. I work on MR. MRI is the most, by far, the most amazing imaging modality ever. It's insane. And if you're interested, I also teach a class, EE225E, which is, starts at 1130. But um, you kind of need to know this material in order to, to take this. But I know there's some are also taking it in this class. But this is it's just an incredible imaging modality in the sense that you can look inside people's bodies and get this detailed information of soft tissue and other information that are just incredible. And what is amazing about this modality is that how it actually relates to signal processing in the sense that um, you could, and especially Fourier transforms, because the imaging is actually, done, the data is collected is actually done in the frequency domain of the image. Okay? So I'm going to give throughout the class some examples uh, of MRI. And of course, I cannot stop talking about this. But it's just an incredible thing that nature gave us 
to be able to probe uh, non-invasively without using any ionizing radiation is completely safe uh, type of an imaging modality. Um, yeah, this is me. So from the inside, very strong heart, as you can see. Um, and I don't know about the brain. So let's start. So what is really DSP? Okay. What is digital signal processing? Digital signal processing or signal processing in general, you want to convert, you know, one signal to another, okay? Like filter it, um, you know, uh, do something that would produce a control signal, for example. Or it is also interpretation and extracting information out of signals. So that's a little bit of a higher level in the sense, like maybe if you want to do um, speech recognition and machine learning over those signals. Okay. Now, DSP deals with discrete samples. So signals are sometimes continuous, but they can actually also be inherently discrete. But in DSP, we only look at discrete signals. And the discrete is not just discrete measurements, but it's also discrete representation, okay, when you represent them on a computer. And so there's implication about having samples which are discrete and not continuous over time or space or whatever dimensional space are you doing. But there's also implication of the discrete representation by using a um, uh, finite number of bits to represent those numbers. And those of you who've taken, you know, 61C, realize, I mean, you have to represent numbers on a computer. So there's different type of representation, fixed point, floating point, uh, how many bits you're going to do it, and you're going to have accuracy or dynamic range issues. And those are going to have implications. Okay. Now, DSP can be samples of uh, a continuous time signal. Uh, give me an example. What is a continuous time signal that we often like to sample? Sound. Sound's a good one. Sound's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Video. Video. Pictures. Right? Those are things that are inherently continuous, but we um, make samples of them. And you do that all the time. But it could be also inherently discrete. So not a representation of... Um, of uh, a continuous process at all. Give me an example. Stocks. Number of students in EE123 on Monday over the course of uh, a year. Right? So that is inherently a discrete thing. Unless we cut you. So why do you want to even, why actually are you here? And I think the reason that you're here is because I posted these, these ads. <laughs> Anybody seen those ads? Okay. Anybody solved those ads? Nobody? I'll make it a homework. We'll make it a homework. Because you need to know what's the, what's the meaning of, you know, of a good, what's the, what was this? No, it wasn't the meaning of life. It was the um, the secret for a good life. So you have to you have to know what the secret is, right? And the cool thing is that we teach you in this class the tools to understand the secret to a good life. And so at least by the end you'll be able to do this no problem. But I would argue that anywhere you go as engineers would be or actually any like scientists, engineers, people, okay? You're going to process signals somehow. In any discipline, there's always processing of signals because we always deal with data, we deal with signals. And so DSP is really kind of like a Swiss army knife of all disciplines that you well, we teach you tools that you can then do these processes in a way that's not necessarily ad hoc, but you actually know how to choose parameters, how to design filters, 
What does it mean to do frequency analysis? What are the trade-offs between all of uh, time, frequ you know, time frequency resolution? And all sorts of these, uh, these ideas. And so it's really, really um, a, a general tool um, to know. And in some way, DSP impacts all our aspects of life. Everybody that teaches in this department always takes their phone out and shows you the phone because everybody has one. But it's just have an insane amount of digital signal processing in it. Not just your camera, not just your accelerometer, not just your radio. I mean, it's just everything there is about processing signals and responses. I mean, you touch, there's a signal when you touch, like you move it that way, you know, this is detected, it's processed, and then classified, and then there's something that happens, okay? It's just insane amount of DSP happens in this one particular device. But cars, self-driving cars, I mean, how much, actually, not even self-driving, you know how much, you know, signal processing happens on a car? I mean, a car, every car has a computer. Why do they have computers? Because they have sensors that send them data, and they have to process that data, and they're going to have make uh, decisions or you know, put lights on and change the control of the car based on that data. All of this is processed. Okay. Multimedia, so MP3. Images, videos. I mean, the Internet is going to be mostly 50%, like, I think within a year or so, the traffic on the internet is going to be videos. Like 50% of it is going to be just videos. Now, if it wasn't for DSP and you were using videos, it would probably be 99.99% video because you won't be able to compress it. And so there's a lot of work that's been done on video compression and all sorts of way of transferring that video in a reliable way so it's all about that is, is signal processing. Health, medical devices. This is actually lots of room for innovation. Lots of these companies like Fitbit, uh, Fitbit, 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 Fitbit and other uh, 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 com device company that make body uh, like wearables, they all use signal processing on like really tiny uh, computing devices in order to store information about your health monitor that, and then you can go and mine and extract information. So in that sense, there's a lot of room for innovation because there's new devices and with completely different computing uh, requirements uh, that could be really, really interesting. And I have to say, there's really a new app uh, here that uses, like it's called, I think, Sleep Cycle or something. It monitors how you sleep overnight, and then only when you kind of like, you move a lot, then you know, they give you a range when to wake you up, so you wake up, like, you know, not grumpy, like I woke up today. Okay. So, you know how they do this? They do this by sending pulses of sound. And then analyzing the reflections and figure out, figuring out, you know, how well you're sleeping, because if you put it, put it close to you, you can actually sense that. And the reason is they, they actually used uh, um, the accelerometers before, but you have to put it on the bed, and if you have a partner on the bed, the, like who, who knows how you can separate the signal between your partner and yourself. But if you put it next to you, and you're sleeping over here, you can actually send pulses, and by the time of flight, of how long it takes, you can separate by distance. Okay? This is similar to Lab 1. And I was astounded to see, I was like, hey, Lab 1, now a company. You know? okay. That's great. Wish we would have done something about it. But there's a lot of room for that. And of course, economy, stock market, there's a lot of processing and, and data mining over there. Now, people have been doing signal processing for a very long time. But what is the advantage of doing it in the digital domain over the continuous time? Well, I, let's say you just want to filter something. I just want to filter. Small filter. I have the 60 hertz noise in my system. Hey. I have this, this annoying, you know, signal in my system. I want to get rid of it. Okay. Great. All right. Let's take a few inductors, capacitors, you know, put it in a circuit, and I filter it up. 
Great. Now it's, it's a really hot day today. Inductor starts drifting. Your filter starts changing. Not so great. I want to change that filter. Well, I have to go take my solder, you know, solder out some component, put back new ones. You see where I'm heading to. If you have things in the digital domain, it's all about software. Okay? It's all about programming or you're just using different filter coefficients in order to perform this filtering operation. So there's a flexibility. The implementation doesn't age in that sense. Okay? And it's also really easy to implement, extremely easy. You, have, you can develop tools, and it's all done in software. Okay? You, of course, there's always a hardware front end. But once things become digital, then everything can be done in software. Huge, highly complex systems can be implemented there. And this software-defined radio I'm going to demo you today, it's one of these examples. So you can use very sophisticated processing. As, as processing becomes cheaper, you can implement better and better systems that are, um, could be, for example, more demanding. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples now of DSP, uh, but there's like infinite amount of them. So with the next 15 minutes, I cannot cover infinite. I'll just give you a few. Okay. The first one is, image comp is, is audio compression. So audio compression using MP3 allows you to compress an audio signal by a factor of 10 with no perceptual loss of, um, of audio quality. This is amazing. By the way, it relies on, um, you know, uh, like so psychoacoustic models. So people have actually learned and tested on humans what is the capability of a human, human system. They characterize as a system. And then uh, signal processing engineers or scientists have developed methods based on these models of how to take that data and be able to represent it in a smaller size by a factor of 10. Huge. Change a whole industry. Uh, now it's maybe not a big deal, but it used to be a huge deal to be able to store uh, audio. Okay. So here's a, an example. Uh, if you look at CD quality, which is you know, theoretically lossless, not exactly true, but it is really, really high quality. Uh, if you play... I am sitting in on the corner I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee and he so this is Suzanne Vega Tom's Diner song that was actually the song that the developers uh, of mp3 format from Fraunhofer Institute they actually used this because it was really really hard to compress because humans are really tuned to see differences in vocal sound you know over evolution we you know, the, the ability to kind of distinguish like small fluctuation in voice. You know, you can see fear or, you know, anxiety. And so we're really, really um, sensitive to human voice. And so it was really, really hard to do. And so they practiced on this one. Once they nailed it, they, they knew that they have something. So this was the original one. Um, now you're going to hear the MP3. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee, and he... And here's the difference. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee, and he... So if you subtract that signal from the original one, that lets you compress your signal by a factor of 10. Now, and I, of course I amplify it by a factor... Uh, actually, I also amplify it. Uh, by, I think, a factor of 10. So it's weaker than, than, the, uh, than the one before. But when you overlay this, turns out that your ears are not able to hear the sound that's overlaid. It's not able because, you know, every, our, our hearing system has limitation. If you play a certain tone, that masks other tones and so on and so forth. Energy in some frequency band masks other uh, signals. So, that ability to remove that signal allows us to compress significantly, and it's all done by DSP. 
By the way, if we're talking about compression, here's a historical form of compression. Uh, I am sitting. I did you hear the Morse code? Morse code is actually one of the earliest form of compression. Um, and Morse code was used for communication. It's kind of like a digital communication that people can understand, if you think about this. Uh, in, in the sense that information or letters are embedded in dots and dashes, so D dots, um, with different lengths. So a dot will be one unit, and a, a dash will be three units. And when they created the code, they looked at a article and looked at the number of occurrences of each letter in the English alphabet. And based on that, they devised a code that would be overall shorter. So an E, which has significant occurrence in the English language, is the shortest representation. So it's a, it's a dot. So 12% of the English language is represented in just a single unit. Okay? Whereas Q, that really rarely occurs, like 0.1% uh, of, like if you look at a page, 0.1% of the number of words is actually, uh, of a number of letters is Q, that has 10 units. Okay? If you had equal units for every letter, then all the codes would be quite long. But because you're actually using the statistics of the English language with the length, then you got your self-compression. And then, once people kind of got bored of, you know, Typing the same messages, they decided, well, you know, uh, so this is the 92 codes used by Western Union from 1859. You know, they're doing a lot of things like, you know, like, wait a minute. They were doing that all the time when they were sending telegraphs. Or best regards or loves and kisses. They're doing that over and over again. And it says, well, can we compress that too so we don't have to send it? So if they send a one, that is, um, means, uh, wait a minute. Or... 73, which is often used by him to say best regards at the end of a conversation. That means best regards. And if you think of what 73 here in Morse code is actually 19 units, but if you would have written uh, best regards, that would be 59 units. So that's another compression uh, on top of that. Okay? Yes? So how do you send 73? How do you send? Yeah. Do, 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 do. Oh, okay, so it's within the context, right? So at the end of a message, they'll send 73, okay, best regards, instead of saying best regards, which would have taken, you know, 59 units. Another example, digital cameras. You know how much processing occurs in your digital camera? Actually, this is even an older slide. There's even more processing that occurs on your digital camera today. For example... Face detection. Face detection happens in real time in your most of your digital cameras today. But data is captured on a CMOS. Often it's a CMOS or a CCT device. And then you want to produce this beautiful picture of this gorgeous kid. Okay. Amazing kid. Right. So there is focus, exposure control, there's some pre-processing that I have to do. You have to understand, for example, what is white. Camera doesn't know what is white. I mean, is this, is this uh, wall white, or at least this wall white? Well, it might be white, but it might be uh, you know, gray, but it's kind of like dark room. So is it gray, or is this white with a dark room? So there's what's called white balancing. So figure out what is the color white. Then this thing called demosaicing. Demosaicing is taking those red, individual red, green, and blue pixels and combining them that are actually in different places, combining in, into uh, color representation. Okay, I'm going to explain that a little bit. There's color transformation to be able to represent it in a better way, not just RGB. For example, luminosity. That's another way of representing things and maybe some other dimension of color, so there's some transformation happening there. Lots of post-processing, filtering. If you actually look at a picture that is generated by your iPhone, Insane amount of processing ha happens there. A lot of it is nonlinear. And then, of course, compression at the end. So here's an example. That will be what a sensor would give you. And you have to then do something to get that, okay? to, do to actually get what is the actual color at every place. Okay? So this is called demosaicing. You also want to do compression. So here's an example of compression 
uh, of about um, 40 that has no perceptual loss of uh, information. And if I then push it further to compress it by a factor of 60, then you start seeing some artifacts that are kind of like these blocky artifacts that appear in JPEG. It's just the way things are compressed. But you know what? It's still not too bad. You can still get a very good representation, but it's not completely lossy. Here's an example how image processing can save children. Um, this is a Canadian pedophile was jailed in Thailand. He posted this picture using a swirl. Uh, like, so he posted a picture of himself using, uh, like he went to Photoshop and did the swirl uh, thing to uh, disguise his face. Turns out it's actually an invertible transform. So you go do unswirl, and then they found his picture. Okay. Right. It, it's not really encouraging you to be pedophile, though. Right. I'm not trying to do that. Right. But signal processing for the purpose of detecting crime. Computational photography, uh, if your sensor is limited by a dynamic range, maybe we, you can just create a few exposures and then use DSP to combine that. And every phone today has HDR on it. And HDR does that. It requires a different uh, exposures and then combines that into a single image that has a larger dynamic range. Let me give you an exa another example of light field cameras by my colleague Gren Eng, uh, the company Lytro. Uh, basically, instead of having just a camera with a CCD, they add small lenses uh, on top of the CCD. Um, you take a picture that looks n like a picture, but not exactly. Uh, you do a lot of computation now, so on a DSP, and the final result will be something like this, and let's see if the link still works. It does, and this is an example where you can actually go and focus on different parts because you have this now extra information from this lensless array. So you actually don't have to have your camera in focus in the first place, but you can actually focus after that. And then there's another uh, thing that you can actually do, which I'm not sure how to turn that thing on, <coughs> which kind of move and look, 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 see an angle. But uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to move on. OK, so um, after you do that, then you start a company. Last example that I want to talk about is uh, computerized tomography that completely changed our life today. And the idea there is that, you know, x-ray, you take an x-ray, it's really just looking at shadows, right? You look at shadows. But that really is a problem if you have things obscuring each, uh, uh, each other. So what people have realized is that if you actually have an x-ray source and detector, you can go and make a lot of shadows from different directions. And then as it turns out, when you do that, then you actually have enough information to recover what's inside. And this is, called, this is called tomography. And by doing DSP, you can actually take these shadows and create the, recreate the cross-section. And you can only do that on a computer. There's no really an analog system that will allow you to do that, which really is incredible. And in the last minute, I'll just mention my favorite field, which is MRI, where data is actually acquired in what's called K-space, which in turn turns out to be a Fourier, the Fourier domain of an image. And once you collect data like that, you can take an inverse DFT in two dimensions and th get this beautiful brain image. So I had a lot of other things to show you. We're just going to continue um, next time, which is on Friday. Well, don't move. Don't move. We're going to continue on Friday. Um, but yeah, we just continue on Friday. <laughs> All right. So see you. If you have any issues with the class or something, come stop by. Okay. You have to do a check off. So uh, we, we.
So you don't have to be there for the entire, like you don't have to participate, but you have to go and do a checkoff for the, for the lab. Yeah, um, maybe we'll have like extra for like checkoff or something. The lab bash is really meant to help you as opposed to just check the people off. And so, okay. So there, there, we, office hours would be maybe another one. Maybe we'll have an office hours for checkoffs too. Yeah. Uh, X. Okay. Oh, does it change what? There isn't a so there's E two twenty five A, which is a graduate level DSP. No, th so this is more like the other one is statistical, like uh, actually statistical signal processing, a little bit more than uh, than this. So it's different. Um, there is no graduate level for a DSP class. Uh, what why did you decide to take it? Huh? So part of it's just for kicks and giggles. Part of it is because um, I was just going to, or basically just the master's plan is to get the uh, DSP language for hardware. Okay. Yeah. No. I, then it just makes sense. Whereas the other one makes sense. Well, the other one is more uh, statistical. So like common filtering, like window filtering. Um, so it relies on that as opposed to um, this class that really teaches you tools like what is DFT, FFT, you know, filter design, analysis of discrete signals, like wavelet transforms. Um, um, what, how does the pass and the pass uh, Okay, what is like minimum requirements? Yeah. Uh, you have to do all the midterms and pass them. Uh, you actually have to do a project. And the homework and the labs, but you need to get a pass grade. So, but uh, you cannot like skip a midterm. Um, you cannot skip a midterm. That that is that is unacceptable. Yeah. Um, we can negotiate a project if you want, but actually, a project would be really you know something that you would actually learn a lot from. And you can use your, for example, your project as the project. What? Uh, Han? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, you can regard me as uh, maybe as a semi-Han because uh, I 